Administrator Shaw and, and Mr. Masiwa will be giving us some concluding thoughts and guidance to take us out today. Um, before they get started though, we thought you'd like to hear some of your voices that we've collected over the last few days. We're here to talk about Feed the Future and to celebrate this incredible initiative. I love Feed the Future. It's a huge success story. Feed the Future is, uh, to me, it's about reinventing, uh, reinventing the way that we do foreign aid. One of the exciting things about Feed the Future is that it is a whole of government effort. Kind of coming in and supporting uh, a local vision, country-owned vision of how to transform agriculture in the developing world. What we see is that by bringing people together and providing them some sort of training and support, they're really able to transform very difficult circumstances to begin to grow uh, food where food hasn't been grown before and to be able to reach out to markets and to integrate into markets so they can create livelihoods for themselves and their families. We focus on small and medium-sized farmers where we empower women where, we, uh, where, we, where, where there's a real focus on nutrition. The investment in people is a crucial part of sustaining Feed the Future. And when we say Feed the Future, we're talking about feeding the intellect of people who will be the future leaders of developing nations. Hunger is a political condition. I mean, we have all the ingredients and the know-how to end it. What we haven't had in the past is the political will to put it all together and actually implement a plan. You know, Feed the Future is like the first big step uh, in that direction. One success story I can talk about is a farmer called Happy Shongwe in Swaziland who went through the 2007 drought period and had to queue up for food from World Food Program which was given through World Vision. But what made Happy different is that she also received training on how to produce commercial seed. Seven years later Happy is producing seed which is certified, packaged, and sold not just to her local community, but the whole of Swaziland. And that ultimately is the goal here of Feed the Future, helping others alleviate poverty, creating the conditions for beneficial exchange with the people of America, and creating a more safe and secure world. There, there is no prospect for world peace while people are starving. They will fight before they die. If you are hungry, nothing else matters. I believe that we can end hunger. I mean, I, I believe that we can, you know, end extreme poverty in this country. I think that's, you know, when I think of, when people ask me when I travel in other parts of the world, what, 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 you know, what, what's, the, what's, what's the best part of the United States, I, I point to these programs. I talk about Feed the Future. We're making progress against hunger. If we could accelerate that progress a little bit, we would reach the Millennium Development Goal of cutting hunger in half. Feeding the Future has to have a roadmap. We created a roadmap in 2007, 2008, and into the administration of President Obama. I want to make sure that all that this administration has done uh, in implementing Feed the Future and putting this plan together, I want to make sure the future administrations follow it. I hope to God that by 2030, there is virtually no extreme poverty, virtually no hunger in, in this country for sure, but also around the world. This is about ending hunger. I mean, what could be more important? Well, I, after that uh, video and seeing such strong uh, bipartisan, bicameral support for Feed the Future, uh, I am uh, really honored to have the opportunity to have a closing conversation with Strive Masiwa to help us process what we heard these last few days and understand what it means going forward. And uh, Strive, maybe I'll start by asking you a question. Sure. And, and that is, you have, been, uh, you have been an extraordinarily successful business leader. You have sat on the boards of incredibly important foundations that have, like Rockefeller, with these long legacies in agriculture. Uh, you've seen the resurgence of investment and focus through Feed the Future and through so many other efforts on efforts to fight hunger. Uh, and you've participated in this meeting these last few days. Uh, and you've spent a lot of time with our president. And you know his commitment to this issue. What's, what, what, have you, what have you learned these last few days that you didn't know coming in 
and what does that mean for what we should be doing taking this effort forward? Well, that's a big question, Raj, <laughs> particularly at the end of the day. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I, let me surprise you with this maybe. I think for me as an observer in, the, in watching your meeting, the most interesting aspect for me has been seeing all your agencies. I mean, I've sort of known your various agencies, obviously, but seeing you all interacting and working together behind this program has actually been incredibly refreshing uh, and exciting. It, it really, it gave me the impression that this has taken very deep roots. And I, I hope that that is something that you you all build on and uh, uh, provide us the leadership for this major uh, humanities mission. Well, well thank you, Strive. I mean, I, when I think about that and having had the chance to hear from so many different leaders in the U.S. government, uh, I'm I'm also frankly overwhelmed by the commitment of spirit. You know, for for Tom Vilsack, this commitment is personal and it's deeply held. And uh, for President Obama, for Valerie, for Susan Rice, who's speaking at the Chicago Council Symposia tomorrow. Uh, these are personal commitments in addition to uh, an American foreign policy commitment. And, and that's very, very exciting and empowering on behalf of this administration. It also makes me wonder uh, what happens when this administration is not here with that deep personal commitment to this issue um, and this very focused presidential commitment. How do we sustain the political commitment? And I wonder, having worked on hunger and addressing poverty through partnership with business, science, good and improved governance, uh, you've been tracking this for a long time. How should we best sustain the progress you're feeling and the sense of everybody's all in this with one strategy and one uh, focus? How do we sustain that over the next 10 or 15 years? Well, you know, uh, one of the wonderful things about the American political system is we all get to watch you on television. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, you know, I, I, I slipped away a couple of times while I've been here on that very issue and went to the Hill and met a few senators and congressmen. And what excited me was the bipartisan nature of this. I met Republican uh, representatives. I met... Uh, Democratic representatives, and I've come away with a sense that you can certainly institutionalize this. I, I hope that uh, your, your government will move quickly to put in place the legislative framework to support Feed the Future in the way that you have done with PEPFAR. Like I said, uh, my opening remarks, uh, PEPFAR is very close to all our hearts as, a, as an American gift. And I loved the, the, what the, the young man from Peace Corps that was sitting here earlier on, I'm going to steal a phrase when he said, uh, you know, I think, what did he call it? Camp Glow. Now we have Camp Grow. <laughs> uh, so so I, I, I feel that Obviously, there's some heavy lifting that we need to do, and you know, you all know your system much better than we do. But I hope it is something that we can look at uh, beyond the momentum we are generating here today. Well, I, I think that's great advice because one of the things we're very committed to, and it requires bipartisan, bicameral commitment is to put in place the legislation that allows Feed the Future, the lessons learned here, 
and the American commitment to end hunger through investments in agriculture and through partnership and country leadership to sustain itself, not just for the next two and a half years, but for the next several decades until the job is done. And uh, I wanna ask all of our partners here today, all of the members of our team that are here today to remember to stay focused on uh, achieving that legislative accomplishment because that will put the force of American law underneath what has been an initiative that I think makes a lot of people proud to be American. Uh, that is also a, an American perspective and point of view. And one of the things we fought hard to do here is to have a genuinely country-owned, partnership-oriented approach. Uh, you are the chair of Grow Africa. You're the chair of the Alliance for the Green Revolution in Africa. Uh, do you think, and from what you saw and heard, do you think that's working? Do you think we are sufficiently embracing, empowering, and following the lead of our partners in Africa and Asia and Latin America as we pursue this goal? Absolutely. You know, um, as I listen to, to, to the process, here, obviously, I began my work with the smallholder farmers, as we saw that as the, as the main issue. But as we have gone along, um, we have realized that investment is crucial. And when President Obama at the G8 meeting in 2012, as you recall, when we launched the new alliance, and that was announced, and we have began to see the private sector uh, taking an interest in agriculture. In a way, Raj, you know, that we haven't seen on agriculture for several decades in Africa. We dropped the ball mm. on this with uh, quite tragic consequences. But we are seeing investment moving now. We are also seeing uh, Africans themselves beginning to invest. Conversations I have with my fellow businessmen is it's all about agriculture, and I'm a telecoms man, you know. Um, the thing is, we just got to make it cool for the kids, you know, <laughs> like with the cell phones. But um, but but I think it's coming. <laughs> I think it is too, and I, I'm excited that we have a telecom leader uh, helping to lead this effort because that is the experience we want to emulate. We want scale, we want investment, we want to unlock human potential, we want to do it quickly, and we want to do it across hundreds of millions of people. And you brought that to a particular industry at a particular time. And, uh, and I think there is a sense coming out of this discussion that if we stay focused, yeah. And if we don't lose sight of the fact that focus on smallholder farmers, focus on women, uh, focus on creating the conditions that allow private investment to take hold, you start to see the great progress that you're talking about. And you were at Camp David uh, during that G8, so you know that that's when we announced something on the order of three and a half billion dollars of investment commitments. And, uh, and you were at, uh, I was in Abuja just a week or two ago, and we saw there a more than doubling of that to now $7.2 billion of investment commitments. And that's not even counting yeah. uh, the tremendous activity in Asia and in, uh, in Latin America. So I, I agree, and I think it's very, very possible if we stay focused on agriculture as a driver of economy, on public-private partnership as the way to get this work done. And that does feel a little different than maybe 10, 15 years ago sure. when we were talking a lot about seeds and fertilizers appropriately, but a little bit less about the role of private companies in unlocking commercial potential. You, you know, uh, from talking with my Grow Africa co-chair hat, I think one of the most interesting thing about the $7.2 billion that we, we've seen now in commitments is we, tra you know, as we know, we're tracking this yeah. and they are self-reporting. 85% of those commitments are now active. You know, they may not have put in seven billion because you can't do it in one day. But, you know, these are serious investments, you know, and what is interesting is, it's, is the pull effect it's having on the smallholders. 
people like Unilever going in and developing programs. So, so that for me is, is part of what we want to see happen. And I, and I think that as we all get more and more engaged, particularly as I, I see a lot of your mission directors, some of whom I've known, you know, for uh, one, of your, one of your colleagues came to see me from Zimbabwe and we hadn't seen each other for good God knows 15, 20 years. So <laughs> even I'm making good, uh, meeting old friends here. So, you know, uh, it's, 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 it's beginning to happen, but we have to remain focused. It is a generational project. But it, as uh, one of the colleagues was saying on the video there, by 2030, you know, Pres uh, uh, President Obasanjo said to me, uh, if you remember when we launched this in Accra, Ghana. 2003. That's right. He said, I'm a general. I'm giving you orders. <laughs> you must end this by 2025. So I I'm glad for the generosity of the extra five years. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I also think it's, it's important to recognize that this is part of a larger movement. Yeah. And uh, one of the things that people have debated, and I know you have pushed hard for, is the ability to describe what this movement is achieving in an ongoing way, in a, in a really credible manner. And uh, our teams have pushed themselves, not just at USAID, but across all our partners and across the interagency in the United States and with countries and with CADF and the AU often in the lead to measure results in a way that's credible. And I've been struck by this year's progress report for Feed the Future by being able to say there are 24,000 families in Honduras that have gone from Point seventy-one cents a day of per capita income to two dollars and thirty-nine cents a day of per capita income. Uh, we all know that agriculture delivers that kind of progress, but measuring it, understanding the benefits that go to women, counting the number of children that are no longer hungry—that's a big part. I suspect of what you were talking about on Capitol Hill, and maybe what you talk about when you meet with African leaders and leaders in Asia and leaders in Latin America to say this is something we can achieve together. You know, absolutely. Remember when, when we went to Camp David, one of the most, uh, I'll share with you a secret from those, those discussions, you know. Uh, we were going to the Camp David meeting and we, we asked, the, I had to ask the question, okay, so how do they sit? How do they ask us the questions? You know, where will the president of France sit and, uh, and so forth? But I spent five hours with President Obasanjo and uh, Kofi Annan because they had been in these sessions. And they said to me, you know, you might only get five minutes to put your position across. Uh, but you know, obviously we ended up with a lot more than five minutes. But the key was, they said, you must be quantitative. You must be able to talk in numbers to President mm -hmm. Obama, in you know, quick numbers. Where are you on this? And you know, he's very quick with those kind of things. But monitoring, evaluation, being quantitative, certainly for me as a businessman, are one of the key issues we like to see. And, and, and having those numbers at your fingertips. So for all of us, it is important if we are to sustain a credible narrative, it must be backed by good Mm -hmm. data, good tracking, and good monitoring and evaluation. Well, and in this case, the numbers speak for themselves. Yeah. Seven million farmers reached, 12 and a half million children no longer hungry, uh, big income gains that are measurable and defined country after country, import substitution, greater crop productivity. It's, uh, I think we want to thank everyone here for the extra efforts you all have made, which I know have not always been popular. Uh, to measure and report on the outcomes because it gives us the capacity Correct. to bring the politics along Correct, yeah. and say, let's do this for a decade or two with real focus and persistence. And in that context, maybe the last point we could discuss here is the role of leadership. I was struck when Minister Calabato, I don't know if she's still here. She's here. Uh, yeah, there you are. Hi. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> of course. Uh, when she spoke and uh, 
indicated to Secretary Vilsack uh, that she benefited from leadership training programs, fellowship programs that help to build a generation of leadership that is, you know, out there getting this done. And uh, we know we both know the minister from Nigeria who also uh, is, a is a dynamic leader in the same spirit. And uh, and it is true that especially after the last panel that investing in young people and having them have the opportunity to see that they can be scientists and political leaders, successful business executives like yourself or uh, civil society activists, but all committed to the same goal of ending hunger through business, science, and social justice is uh, perhaps something we all take with us as a responsibility to make sure that we're building that generation of leadership. And I wonder if you were to leave us with parting thoughts, and I know your passion for engaging young people in this effort, uh, what would they be? What can we do to continue to build that cohort of next generation leadership? You know, I, I, I heard a fascinating phrase here, Raj, radical collaboration. I, I, I absolutely love that. I'm gonna put it on the wall when <laughs> I get back because it, because it is about a collaboration that has to be pretty radical. I, th I think that whilst we've all wanted to see an African green revolution for a long time, it's really only now that one could say the leadership is there. And I mean, you guys have, you know, if you recall when President Obama came with you to Tanzania, uh, and we had that- Technically, I came with him. It's his <laughs> <airplane>. <laughs> 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 right, yeah. and um, when, when, you, when we were in uh, Dar es Salaam, he asked that question, you know, what do you need from me? Yeah. And uh, we all would almost, uh, one voice said, leadership. Yeah. Stay with us on the leadership play. America is about leadership. Uh, you may not have chosen it for yourself, but you have it. You, have, you provide leadership. And since you've started to provide leadership to this issue, we have seen extraordinary movement. You know, uh, because it's at the end of the day, it's about Africans owning this green revolution. We have ministers like Agnes, uh, uh, my wonderful colleague from Rwanda, but her president, you know, I remember on one occasion, we had a meeting with him on, on agriculture. I went home, Sunday evening, he called me. <laughs> and he said, you know, we didn't finish that conversation. It, it is that kind of passion. President Kikwete, who, as yeah. you know, uh, leads with you on the Leadership Council for, for, for Grow Africa. So leadership is crucial. But you know, coming back to the issue of youth, and this is the paradox we have to address. The African farmer is a woman, mm. and she's aging. Mm. We, we have to get her son and her daughter into agriculture. And, the, and it's becoming now a national security, if not a global security issue for all of us, because these young people can be so easily radicalized, as we are seeing in the Sahel and on the Horn of Africa. Mm -hmm. So time is not on our side. No. We have to get the young people into agriculture. And we have to get them out of the sense that agriculture is a poverty trap of their parents. That's why they don't wanna be there. So it's incredible when we hear the young Peace Corps volunteer who is in Ethiopia with the kind of enthusiasm mm. that he has. And we have to, get that across Africa, but we have to get it executed in a, in a practical way. To, agriculture gives us the simplest tool that we have. Two thirds of our people are employed by agriculture. So where else to start than to get where the jobs are? So this is where we really need your help. Uh, we got, we, we, we've got to come up with the strategies to make agriculture cool. 
You're in the right place, Strive. <laughs> <laughs> Thank this you. This is a room full of leaders committed fully to that vision and, uh, and I think willing to embrace the responsibility to stick with that vision, not just for a few years, but for as long as it takes to deliver the result you described. And um, with that, I think we want to say thank you to all of you. If I may just, oh, yeah. really, I just want to thank this man, you know. <laughs> he has brought so much energy. Raj, it's been so refreshing. Thank you. And thank you all for the e efforts that you are making. It's, it's late in the day, and you are all still here. So agriculture is cool. It is cool. It, thank it, you. Sorry, what, I, what I'm amazed by is that I've never before been to a three-day conference that seems to grow in size <laughs> as the days go I on know. and as you get into the afternoon. Wow, we all get it. There, there are a few people I do want to make sure we recognize uh, specifically for their, their great leadership. Uh, when, uh, when we constructed Feed the Future, it was an interagency effort led by the White House and Hillary Clinton played a central role in helping to shape how we took this on. And she decided at the State Department to build a whole division that would focus on food security and use the tools of diplomacy for the purpose of achieving a traditional development outcome and supporting our efforts. And uh, Jonathan Schreier, the deputy coordinator for Feed the Future, has been for years an extraordinary advocate for this mission, this cause, and this new model of, uh, of working together in a way that really puts the full power of American foreign policy against something that we all feel passionate about. And Jonathan, you will be moving on, uh, I know, to a different post in a, in a very short amount of time, and we'd like to say thank you. Could you please thank stand you. up? Stand up. And, you know, Jonathan benefits from getting to work with a, a significant and outstanding team. And at USAID, we have a parallel significant and outstanding team. And it's a team that has to put up with me more than most of our groups. So they, uh, I think they sometimes appreciate that. But mostly, <laughs> mostly they end up working a lot more than many other parts of our organization because uh, they have to deal with me and, and they have to deal with the Congress and they have to deal with the White House and everybody else. And the person who kind of brings it all together for us is Jada McKenna. And I don't, She's do I see Jada? Did son. she go to collect? She left. Oh, she went to, to collect, collect her son. son from daycare. Well, well, maybe we could, maybe on her behalf, I will say I've had the chance to work with Jada for years, as have you, Strive. She was with me at the, uh, before I was in this role even. And uh, I am every day honored and excited that she and her whole team, whom I see here uh, around the table, uh, bring the passion and commitment they do. They have been working so hard. So I, even though she's not here, can we please give her a big round of applause because I'm so proud of her. <laughs> and finally, I just want to thank all of you. Uh, you all have uh, not just stuck this out, but added so much uh, thinking and, and value to this effort. Uh, we need you to be successful over the many, many years ahead. And I think we are all committed here. Uh, and America as a nation is committed to make sure that you have the tools necessary to be successful. But most of all, we're just really, really proud to be able to be part of this effort with you. So thank you for your leadership. Thank you for being here. And I would think with that, we conclude the first ever Feed the Future Global Forum. Thank Congratulations. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.